So this morning, the title of today's message is Unity in the Church. And you know, as we begin our fifth year as a church, this is our five-year anniversary, the Lord has done some amazing things here at the church. You know, and he's blessed us tremendously, and I hope that you've been blessed as well. And so as now he begins this new chapter um, in, our, you know, in our church, there's an important topic that I want to speak on that I think is very important for us as we continue to grow as a church, and that's unity among the fellowship of believers. And so this morning I've titled today's message, The Unity of the Church. And we'll be in Ephesians chapter 4, but while you're turning there, let me mention this. Unity is vital among the local church, among here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. Because when empowered by the Holy Spirit, there is nothing that can stand or will stand against us. When Peter admitted that Jesus to Jesus that he was the Messiah, the Son of the Living God, in Matthew 16, 16, Jesus responded by telling him in verse 18 that on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower, overpower it. Now, I want you all to just take a moment to think about some of the things that brings groups of people together and the, feeling, the feelings, emotions that it creates for a moment in time or a couple hours, a few hours. The whole stadium, the whole arena, the whole group is almost feels as one. So my question to you all this morning is this the same feeling you have when you come to church on Sundays? Or when you attend that Bible study? Do you feel the same sense of unity amongst the fellowship? Now let me ask you this. this. What have you done to maintain a sense of unity in the church? J.C. Ryle said this, Nothing can altogether overthrow and destroy the church. Its members may be persecuted, oppressed, imprisoned, beaten, beheaded, burned, but the true church is never altogether extinguished. It rises, against, it rises again from its uh, afflictions. It lives on through fire and water. When crushed, in one hand, it springs up in another. The Pharaohs, the Herods, the Neros have labored in vain to put down the church. They stay, they slay their thousands and then pass away and go to their own place. The true church outlives them all and sees them buried and sees them bury each in his turn. It is an anvil that has broken many hammers in the world and will break many a hammer still. It is a bush which is often burning, and yet it and yet is not consumed." Unquote. In a Peanuts cartoon, Lucy demanded that Linus change TV channels, threatening him with her fist that if he didn't, uh, threatening her fist if he didn't. What makes you think you can walk right in here and take over, asks Linus. These five fingers, says Lucy. Individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this into one single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. Which channel do you want, asks Linus. Turning away, he looks at his fingers and says, why can't you guys get as organized like that? 
you see church. As individuals, we are simply fingers, but when curled up tightly, gripping the Holy Spirit, we are a powerful fist. Well, Paul wrote a lot on this issue of being united or knitted together as a body. And so today, we're going to look at what he specifically wrote to the Ephesian church on the subject. If you haven't turned there, um, I'll be reading from Ephesians, from the fourth chapter of, of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. And, um, and before we begin, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Lord God, we are so thankful that you've brought us here. We are so thankful that you love us and care for us and that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. That we're now your children and that you're truly our Heavenly Father. So on this day, as we celebrate Father's Day, Lord, and as we celebrate our 50 year anniversary of the church, Lord, we give you all the honor and all the glory. And we're so thankful you brought us this far. And so now speak to us powerfully as we get into your word, Lord. May this message go out powerfully to you, Lord. May those who are watching and listening to this um, hear it. May it penetrate their hearts and their minds, Lord. And Grow, to be strengthened, and to be encouraged, Lord, as well as those that are here. So again, fill this room with your spirit, Lord, and speak to us now with this message. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So before I begin, you know, Paul begins this chapter, Ephesians chapter 4, in the same way he does throughout the other epistles, the other letters. Theology, doctrine, and exposition to practical application. So it says there in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, Bearing with one another in love, making every, every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Therefore, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all. And in all. In chapter 4, verse 1, again, he says, Therefore, I, a prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. There, Paul transitions from the first three chapters of our rights and privileges as adoptive children to how we can apply this in our lives today. And so here, Paul is essentially saying, Okay, guys, now that you know what God did for you and where you stand because of God's grace, I'm urging, begging you to live and walk in a manner that reflects the new person you were called to be. This new person he's speaking of is the new born again believer is that person that you that new person you became when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and when the Holy Spirit made his home in you. First Corinthians chapter five verse fifteen says therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation. All things have passed away Behold, all things have become new. He further explains this later in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, saying that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. 
So as new people, this ought to inspire you. This ought to inspire us as a church to hold ourselves at a higher standard than the rest of the world. This is part of what it means to be the salt and light of the world. We're told in Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to, uh, to, thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friend, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath. Because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. And so as we move to verse 2, we'll see how, we're, we see how uh, we ought to do that and what that looks like. Let me read that again. Verse 2, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love. Here, Paul lays out four distinct ways on, on what our conduct and attitudes should look like. Lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, and bearing with one another in love. Now, the first one he mentions is lowliness. Lowliness is not loneliness, but lowliness is humbleness. It's having the humble opinion of oneself or a deep sense of one's moral littleness. Philippians 2.3 tells us what this looks like. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Consider others as more important than yourself. Next, he mentions a gentleness, or in other words, meekness. The usual definition of meekness in the, in the Bible is strength under control. Now, the world defines strong people as those who are assertive, take charge, proud, self-sufficient, self-reliant, and independent. A meek person, however, is the opposite of these things. But many people misinterpret meekness with weakness. See, a meek person is willing, that's an important word there, is willing to be submissive, is humble and gentle, relies on God, and is dependent on him to provide strength in those times and in those areas where we are weak. Christ uses this, uses it in his own disposition in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. There, Jesus says, take up your yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly, lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, if our goal is really to be like Jesus, we should seek to be lowly. We should seek to be gentle. We seek to be meek. Jesus also mentions, also mentions this in the third of his Beatitudes. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. And in the New King James, New King James Version, it says, Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Let me reiterate, don't misinterpret meekness for weakness. Because really, that's strength. Strength in the Lord. Thirdly, 
Paul mentioned long-suffering. This is the quality of self-restraint in the face of provocation, which doesn't hastily retaliate or promptly punish. It's the opposite of anger and is associated with mercy. Patience is a quality that doesn't surrender to circumstances or succumb under trial. It's the opposite of despondency and is associated with hope. It's the same patience that God shows us when we deliberately sin. Paul understood this. And that's why he wrote to, he wrote this to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus, might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Long suffering in your trials and tribulations, in your challenges, when things aren't going your way, it just seems like the devil's attacking you left and right, left and right. Are you long-suffering? But the Lord wants you to be. He wants you to endure in those times. You trust in Him. You hold on to Him in those difficulties. And as a church, when we are going through challenges, when we're going through difficulties, We're going to maintain that heart of long suffering. We're going to continue to be patient. Because we know the Lord's going to continue to do some great things, just as He's done before. Next one, last one, fourthly, He mentioned bearing with one another in love. Now, the idea behind this statement is holding each other up when there's no strength. Keep going. It's supporting one another through the difficulties of life. It's also enduring and forgiving one another when we've been wronged. Paul describes this some more in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you are also to forgive. If we're going to continue to grow as a church, we need to have this heart. Especially as more people come here, especially with different personalities, different um, backgrounds, different histories, different issues. We have to bear it with one another in love, even if your personalities clash. Opinions sometimes clash. But in the end, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're united by the Spirit. That's what brings us all together. Brothers and sisters in Christ, these four qualities are meant to help us to diligently seek after the very thing that will give us the local body here, fresh vision, Calvary Chapel, the ability to strengthen us amid spiritual warfare. Well, as we move on to verse 3, we see that this is here, that verse there is a vital link between Verses 1 and 2, and verses 4 to 6. So let me read that too. Let me read that again. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Here, Paul is speaking of the Spirit in the bond of peace. At a meeting of the American Psychological Association, Jack Lipton, 
a psychologist at Union College, and R. Scott Bullion, a graduate student at Columbia University. And present, they presented their findings on how members of various sections of 11 major symphony orchestra perceived each other. The percussionists were viewed as insensitive, unintelligent, and hard of hearing, yet fun loving. String players were seen as arrogant, stuffy, un and unathletic. The orchestra members overwhelmingly chose loud as a primary objective to describe the brass players. Woodwind players seem to be held in the highest esteem, described as quiet and meticulous, through, though a bit egotistical. Interesting findings, to say the least. With such widely divergent personalities and perceptions, how could an orchestra ever come together to make such wonderful music? The answer is simple. Regardless of how those musicians view each other, they subordinate, they, they subordinate their feelings and biases to the leadership of the conductor. Under his guidance, they play beautiful music. See, in Christ, God has united all believers in the Holy Spirit. He is our conductor. United as a universal church. And what I mean by that is by every single worldwide born-again believer. And united as a local church. The body of believers here, every single one of you that have made Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel your home church. The unity of this church. This unity brings us together in a common purpose, which is to bring the lost, the broken, the blind, the deaf to the arms of the Savior and Healer, Jesus Christ. So our people outside these doors, in your communities, in your neighborhood, that are broken, that are lost. They spent years looking for answers in all kinds of different things, but haven't been able to find them. We still feel empty. We still feel shattered. So we maybe we can call to share the message of hope. To share the message of Jesus Christ. That will bring that healing. That will bring them whole. That will fill in that, that emptiness that they've been feeling for so many years. Our role, our responsibility as a church, as born again believers, to share that message. Be truthful, be honest with you, doesn't always have to be with us. Be done with your actions. You say, actions speak louder than words. You can love. People, you can share the gospel by just your actions as well. And, you know, I've, seen, I've seen this happen many times. Or just by doing something nice, by doing something good, by doing something respectful, it will open up the doors to actually use the, your words to tell them about Jesus. And what Jesus did for you. And how he saved you from sin. And now all your sins are forgiven. Great opportunity. As 
as is with any organizational structure. Conformity to the rules and standards of the collective is essential for growth. If that growth is to be an expected outcome. Examples. Our nation. Our military. Our law enforcement. Certain jobs. Schools. Yes, even your home. What do you think would happen if any one person adopted an individualistic mentality and refused to conform to the set standards set by that group? That person becomes an outcast. That person is kicked out and told, you know what, you can't conform to You can't. You live by the rules, you can't live by our standards. You gotta go. We have to stop thinking and acting like lone rangers and become tightly knitted together. And I'm speaking here as a church. We need to become a tightly knitted group, bonded together by the Holy Spirit out of love. For one another, motivating each other, strengthening each other, encouraging each other, blessing each other, forgiving each other. Why? So that together you may be, you may with one voice. Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul also wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, Complete my joy, being out of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. As with all things, we must find a balance. And tread carefully when it comes to unity. See, a danger lies when a group is so united. It becomes an inclusive group that refuses to open itself up to those on the outside. Danger. One danger is living in a religious bubble. For example, that's what... Jesus saw with the Pharisees and the legalistic Sadducees. And today we see it in many churches where and they live in a bubble. They, they see outsiders as strange and give them that eye like, you know, what, what are you doing here? What do you want? And, you know, are you going to ruin this, this group here? Well, it becomes legalistic. It becomes a religious you know, group. We have to welcome everyone here in this church. I want us to welcome everyone with open heart. We don't know what people's intentions are. You don't know what you know, where what what's going on with them, what background they have, where you know, what's going on in their lives. And, and so we have to be able to allow. People to come and just hear the message and show them the love of Christ. We have to be united in that, in those actions. Because that's how people are going to know this is a spirit filled church. And that we are a spirit filled people. You see, having, living in a religious world can cause animosity towards those outside. And it becomes difficult to reach those on the outside. And love towards the lost, it ceases. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 32, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 19, it says this, 
Therefore, love the stranger. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And it tells us that we were once sinners ourselves. We were once like those outsiders. And now in Christ, you have to love those that are on the outside. Just as you were loved. I want us to read one more passage together. So if you can, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You keep your finger on uh, Ephesians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to be reading the first seven verses. If you can just read along. If I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith, so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions, and if I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Verse 7, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. The unity that we are capable of attaining is a picture of the overall greater unity we have in Christ. Well, when we read the next three verses, you'll see why verse 3 is a vital link. So uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 4. We'll read that again. Therefore, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at, at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in all. Ladies and gentlemen, church, brothers and sisters in Christ, born again believer in Christ, we are one body. The universal church and the local church here. One spirit, we have one spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is now residing, is now living in us. We have one hope, the hope of living in eternal glory with Christ in heaven. One Lord, one faith. One baptism. This is a Christian distinction that separates us, that, that distinguishes us from polytheistic religions. What I mean by that is religions that have more than one God. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. You see, we serve a God who is omniscient. That means he knows everything. We serve a God who is omnipotent, who is all-powerful. We serve a God who is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at all times. We serve a God who is immutable. He's unchanging. The same God from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 is the same God from Revelation. Last verse from the last chapter in Revelation. He's unchanging. He is the same. He's attributes. Omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, immutable, holy. These attributes make God distinct 
and above the gods of all monotheistic religions, all the gods, all those religions that claim to have one God. And my challenge to all of you today, this morning, before we close, is to make a self-examination of where you're at and ask yourself, are you living your Christian life as an individual seeking only to get what you can? Or are you living your Christian life united with your Christian brothers and sisters to serve one another and fulfill the calling which you were called, which of uh, uh, what God called you to be? Are you being a lone ranger? Or are you part of the kingdom? The Lord wants us to be united. Loving one another, caring for one another, watching out for forgiving one another. So, if you haven't done that, if that's not, if you feel like that hasn't been something you, you've been doing and you just been con- coming to church because you just you know, want to do your thing and you know, you just want to, it's just a part of your works, your religious works, in order to gain brownie points with God, well, it's not he looks at your heart. He knows what's going on inside of there. You can't hide from him. You can hide it from others, but you can't hide it from him. And so, as, as we close and before we close in prayer, we ask him to fill you anew with the Holy Spirit. If you begin doing that today, again, as we begin this new chapter of, our, of this church. I'm excited. The Lord's going to do. It'll take a while for me to get used to calling our church Fresh Christian Calvary Chapel, but I'm excited. The next things, future things that are await us when we serve the good God. And I want to turn to those who are watching, listening, and here and haven't submitted your life to Jesus Christ. Now you're ready. You see them, you're ready to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You've been broken, you've been lost, you've been seeking for answers, and you haven't been able to find them in alcohol, drugs, pornography. You haven't been able to find it out there in the world. You can find it with Jesus Christ. You can find it at the cross. Jesus Christ came to die for your sins, to forgive you. Of your sins. All you have to do is ask. And if you ask and believe that He is the Son of God, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. Believe in your heart that He's now with Him in heaven. So if you want that forgiveness, allow me to lead you in a prayer to do that. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. For those of you who are here watching this, we pray for those who are praying for the God will empower them. If you're ready to see Jesus, pray this. Lord Jesus, I admit and confess that I'm a sinner. And I ask you right now to forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead. And so now I repent of my sins and I turn away from them and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. So now I ask that you fill me with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me, so that He will strengthen me, so that He will help me in my time with Him, so that He will show me and teach me in my newborn again life. 
in your name. Pray this. We pray that welcome to the family of God. And we want you to get a hold of us. And hear from you, your story, and your, you know, how you heard this message. If you're watching it, please share it with others out there. You, know, you can contact us through our website and through our social media. And we've updated it. If there any, you see any slight thing, anything in there that we need to change, let me know. And sometimes I'll, I'll overlook some stuff, but yeah, uh, let me know. And thank you for watching this week's message. Thank you, or if you've been with us for the past five years, thank you for your support. And uh, look forward to seeing what the Lord is going to continue to do here. So join us next week as we continue. We're going to begin into our in our in Second Samuel. We finished uh, First Samuel a few weeks ago, and now we're going to move on to Second Samuel. So join us. We we welcome you, and, and we look forward to seeing you at that time. So for now, goodbye and farewell.